Welcome to the Sales Lab. My name is Anthony Gross, host of today's program. Today's program is all about the power of understanding people and the keys to increasing sales, improving your organizational performance, and strengthening your relationships. Our guest today is Dave Mitchell. He's the founder of The Leadership Difference and author of a fantastic book called The Power of Understanding People. I'm excited to have Dave on our program because of the work he has done on understanding your customers' unique communication styles and how you can respond to them to achieve a greater level of success. So Dave, welcome to our program. Oh, it's great to be here, Anthony. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was going through my notes and I don't know if you remember, but the first time I met you was almost 11 years ago. Oh my and, gosh. Yeah, and it was fascinating <laughs> because I was going through my notes and I remember how the first time I heard this material, how it affected me because it connected a gap or it, it made a bridge in a gap of information that I had never heard before. So I'm excited to share that with our audience. But before we begin, I'd love to hear, because you have a very diverse background, tell me about, <laughs> tell me about your journey and how you ended up becoming an author and founder of The Leadership Difference. What's, what's your path been? Yeah, you know, bios read really well looking backwards, but the, the life that got you there is, is far less linear than, than that journey would appear. But yeah, I mean, honestly, Anthony, I really, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. I, I played uh, baseball as long as I could until unfortunately a, uh, a lack of talent ended my career, <laughs> uh, which, uh, you know, now I'm in college and I don't know what I want to be when I grow up because I'm not going to be the first baseman for the New York Mets. So I, I spent some time in uh, at uh, CBS as a reporter and producer, television reporter and producer. Um, I liked the communication part of that, but it wasn't mm -hmm. a great fit for me. I wanted to do something that I really felt like would positively affect people. And eventually I ended up in a, a corporate training job for Marshall Fields in Chicago and the light went on. That was my passion. It, Mm -hmm. took me a while to figure out uh, I had to extricate myself from the human resources department because I kept getting promoted into, you know, HR leadership roles and away from the training function. And it was the training function that I really loved. Mm -hmm. So I started the leadership difference in 1995 just so I could focus uh, entirely on providing education, specifically education about leadership and relationships and sales training and customer service excellence. Uh, to organizations all around the world. And I've been doing that ever since. Yeah. And you, you, you started it in 1995 and now we fast forward already to 2022. Can you yeah. give, well, give me a short introduction on, <laughs> on the leadership difference, what you're doing now and how you're helping organizations? Yeah. Well, so I'm, I'm four books in now. The Power of Understanding People mm -hmm. was my second. It was an Amazon editor's choice for best business book. And, and that program that it's based on actually won the Meeting Madness for best, uh, best seminar of the year at the World Education Congress in Las Vegas in 2013. So that, that kind of put me on the map. But since then, I've written books about understanding yourself, because that's one of the things I learned as I've gone around the world teaching people how to understand others is a significant percentage of people don't even understand themselves. So I had to kind of back up and, and get to the root material, right? Uh, and then my most recent book is called Peak Performance Culture, the Five Metrics of Organizational Excellence. So I like to think of those last three books as a trilogy, understand yourself, understand others, understand all of us when we're working together as a group. So that's what I've been doing. And in the last two years, a lot of it in this format. <laughs> Well, tell me, tell me, tell me something we don't know about you. What's, what is, what is Dave well, like if, off? If you're referring to those pictures on the internet, I, I didn't, I had no idea there was a camera <laughs> uh, at that party. <laughs> I, I think uh, the, the big surprise for most people is my side hustle in the wine industry. I'm a certified advanced wine sommelier. I have an ownership stake in a winery here in Walla Walla, Washington. Uh, my lovely bride manages a tasting room here. So, so uh, you know, people see me uh, as they should in this role as leadership educator, but uh, they're sometimes surprised to find out that I also have a, a, a more than a toe dipped in the wine industry. Well, that's fantastic. Well, we're going to ask some wine questions later because I, <laughs> you know, and I'm as sure the I'm sure the audience and and I can just say this because I know my audience. If you make it to Walla Walla, Dave will treat you to wine. Oh, absolutely. Um, I can I can get you in places that you can't normally get into. 
all 5,000 of you. (laughs) So (laughs) now in in your book, it's fascinating. I love your book. I've read it three times, although my book is signed to Heidi, which we can talk about off camera. That's, but that, that, that but, same party. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but you quote your father. I love this quote. You quote your father, and he was in sales, and it just touched me <laughs> in the introduction of the book. And he said, the world would be a wonderful place if it weren't for people. Amen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right there, it was, it was, it was, it had me. But yeah. but seriously, you talk about jobs that require you to make a living satisfying the general public's needs is very challenging. And the key to understanding the mysteries of human behavior involves a concept called metacognition. I love this word. I keep learning it every other year when (laughs) I reread your book. So for our audience, explain what is metacognition? Yeah, um, it's funny. When you call your company the leadership difference, you should be prepared to answer the question, so what's the difference, which I hadn't anticipated when I came up with that name. So over the 27 years that I've been doing this, I, I, I've tried to really distill down some of these characteristics that uh, prepare people to be effective doing what you just described, right? Working with people either in sales or in service or in leadership roles. And so now when someone says, what's the difference? I I say metacognition, partially because I know they won't know what that means. So that will up (laughs) my credibility. It may just shut them up entirely. Uh, But what it means, uh, and if you're an educator, you've heard this term probably because it it literally translates to thinking about thinking or thinking about how you think. So uh, to truly understand the behaviors of others, you really do need to have a firm understanding of your own Uh, thought processes and why you behave the way you do and why certain things trigger you and why other things don't bother you but seem to bother other people. Uh, So it's this journey of going inside. It's like, Anthony, it's like self-awareness on steroids. You know, I, 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 I work with a lot of CEOs that I've observed engaging in toxic behaviors. And when I talk, I, I call them on it, They'll say things like, yeah, I know I do that. That's just me. You know, I like to tease pretty hard. And 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 so they're saying, yeah, I'm self-aware, but you're still creating negative consequences for that behavior. So metacognition would, would require you to go, well, why do you feel the need to tease people? Why do you feel the need to, to cut down their level of confidence? Is this, are you threatened by them somehow? Or, or do you have a need to feel superior to them? And this is how you create that. So metacognition is is kind of that deeper, more intense going to the root cause of of what you know about yourself. Right. And I love that in the book because you start evaluating uh, your behavior and your needs and understanding yourself then to better understand others and to identify them. And I, I really like that because that's outside the, uh, the realm of traditional sales training that, that we get. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But in the book, one thing that really stood out to me, and this resonated with me, but I've never been able to unpack the why. And in the book, you talk about high performers having high efficacy. In other words, they're, they have such strong uh, situational awareness and are very competent. So if you have a skill set, you do very well, right, with high right. efficacy. However, confidence and performance can vary by interaction. And, you know, I've been in sales almost my whole life and I still run into situations where the initial rapport is poor, I'm nervous, I'm uncomfortable, uh, or your confidence or something, and then performance drops. Why why does performance (laughs) drop in certain situations and not in others? Yeah, I loved hearing your explanation of that, Anthony. I felt I felt like Yoda watching Luke finally embrace the Force. It was it was, I loved it. Uh, you're absolutely right. You know, I, I joke sometimes. I say we all say you know everybody's different, but then the first time they prove that, it's very irritating to us. Um, you know, I cut. I did a lot of my training uh, at did, formerly worked at Disney. Um, Disney has a commitment to training like no other organization, and we would relentlessly train people at all levels. I mean, if you're going to be goofy at the parks, you're still going to go through two weeks of intensive training before we release you into the wild, as we called it. Uh, And then, you know, so we do this and and I headed up training for this particular division of Disney. And, um, you know, we'd have all these metrics and all these ways to try to make sure this person knew what they were doing, that they had self-efficacy. 
and that they were competent. And then we'd release them and then we'd get feedback from the managers that, well, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, and it was just demoralizing. It's like, well, well, we can't keep them for six months. How do, what's going wrong here? And what I came to realize was competency is only part of the equation. Most people achieve competency. But to, to really realize your full potential, you have to combine competency with confidence, with self-efficacy. So in sales, for example, if I meet someone and I immediately connect with them, I immediately have strong rapport, I get them, I like them, I like the way they think, I, you know, they, they respond to my humor, whatever it is, my confidence, my self-efficacy is going to go up and therefore mm -hmm. my competency can, can reach its full potential combined with my confidence. I'm going to get this deal because I'm operating on all cylinders. Literally go to my next call. And the guy's clunky. I mean, I'm just, you know, I just, I can't connect with him. I can't read him. We're not, there's no rapport there. Nothing has changed about my competency because I, but because I lose my self-efficacy, my competency diminishes. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I forgot how to sell, but I'm now spray and pray, you know, show up and throw up. I'm clunky. We all, we, we all have days where we just are not at our highest level, right? It's right? Those days where we say, I know I know how to do my job. I'm just not displaying any evidence of it right now. Um, and that's typically because, it's not because we forgot how to do the job, it's because we're having a lack of confidence, lack of self-efficacy. So a lot of the book is about how do I broaden that feeling of self-efficacy to the biggest population of people? So that, um, so I mean, inevitably, I'm still gonna run into that person that's just hard for me. But let's make that maybe one out of four instead of two out of four. And that, right. as you know, you're a numbers guy and a sales professional. It, it broadening your market share by just 25 percent translates to huge numbers. Right. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So how how do I improve my skills? I mean, is there something I need to be working on or how, how does that work? Now, are, are we talking about you specifically, Anthony? Uh, <laughs> I do have some thoughts here that I put no. uh, Well, I think the, the first part comes from uh, the metacognitive part is just the realization that it, it's not them, it's you, right? Um, mm -hmm. it, it's funny how many cliches we hear over and over and over in our, our, our life, but we never really internalize them. Uh, so, you know, let's use sales again as an example. Um, it's real easy at the end of the day to come home and just like, oh my God, these customers, just like my dad, right? The world would be a wonderful place for more for people. Why can't they just recognize the value that I bring to them? Why can't they see how much better my services are going to be than any of my competitors? Well, you can't alter the other person's perspective. What you have to do is understand it and do a better job of framing your own value to that person. So let me, let me give you a specific example. Mm -hmm. So in the book, I talk about four iconic ways of thinking, romantic, warrior, expert, mastermind. Mm -hmm. So romantics, because of their emotional sensitivity, put a high value on relationships. Warriors are more logical. So they put a high value on efficiency and results. That's two very different types of consumers and two very different types of sales. I could be really good. As, let's say I'm a romantic. I'm really good at building relationships. I come with a smile. I ask about your family. I get to know you. I'll go take you to lunch. But mm -hmm. if the person I'm talking to is a warrior, all of that's a waste of time because you're not showing me how are you going to make my life easier? How are you going to save me time? How are you going to make me money? How are you going to take something off my things to do list so that I don't have to worry about it? I don't care if you're a nice guy. I don't care if you care about my family. I need solutions to these problems. So that's two entirely different ways to frame, you know, the services that mm -hmm. you offer. And if you don't recognize these different types of consumers and make that adjustment, then you'll eventually be very good at selling to one or two types of person, but woefully inadequate for the other two or three. Yeah. So, so it raises the question, um, how do, do we recognize others' preferred communication styles? And do we first need to understand our own style? Right. Well, the cheapest way to do that is buy my book. Uh, and then uh, the second best way is to hire me to come and, and train your people. But if, short of that, <laughs> you do have to, you know, it's again, it, it's not necessarily something that we don't know. I think we just don't pay attention to it. 
<laughs> we get consumed by, okay, here's my pitch. Here's what I want to say. Here's what I want to promote. And what we really need to be doing, particularly in the early parts of the relationship with a potential customer, is paying attention to them. Uh, what do they respond to? How do they behave? Uh, do they take an interest in me? Do they smile a lot? Do they ask about me and my background? These are all pretty good behavioral cues that rec that would uh, reflect a romantic, someone who wants a relationship before they need to know what your company does. There's this other style that is known for its inquisitiveness, that just uh, questions and questions and questions and questions of increasingly specific uh, detail, right? That you feel mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, are you a competitor? Or are you trying to out some, you know, trade secrets from me? This is this is way beyond the level of knowledge that most of my customers ask. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the hallmark of an expert. Experts are notorious for their need for knowledge. Uh, experts hate to make mistakes. They're very risk averse. And so they combat that risk adversity with with knowledge and education and getting to know everything so they can make very, very safe and, and unimpeachable decisions. So you've got to pay attention to these things and not be so in your head about how am I going to present this? How am I going to pitch this? What am I, you know, just, just figure out your consumer first because everything else will be based on identifying and establishing the rapport with that customer. So if you haven't, if you don't do that, then everything else you're doing is just is back to spray and pray. You're just, I'm going to pitch him and, and pray. Yeah. And that, and that was interesting in the book. And you talked about recognizing their behavioral cues and then also understanding your own style. And we'll get into need in a second here, but you know, is it easy for people to adjust their style to another person's style? Um, Easy. Uh, what's easy, right? How do you quantify easy? Is it comfortable? I, is it natural for somebody to adjust their style, or does it, right. or is it challenging for somebody? So, so I'm an old baseball guy, right? So I'm going to put it in a baseball uh, analogy, and hopefully mm -hmm. that works. Um, I, I, I was a moderately successful switch hitter, uh, but that didn't happen right away, uh, it required me to take a lot of, I'm left-handed, I take a lot of extra batting practice right-handed. Uh, and um, and so I could, I, be, I could become a serviceable right-handed hitter, particularly in certain situations. Once I reached a certain level of comfort, then it wasn't hard for me to hit right-handed. I, I was never as good a right-handed hitter as a left-handed hitter, but I could do it. Mm -hmm. Switching your style is a little like that. It, it's like the more you do it, uh, the, the more comfortable you get at it and the easier it becomes. But initially, it's going to feel a little awkward. And I think that's one of those hurdles that, that, that challenge us to do it. Like most things in life, if it feels uncomfortable to us, oh, this can't be good because I'm feeling uncomfortable. Quite the opposite. This is a skill that can be very useful if you just push through that discomfort and get proficient at it. Now, there's a limit to that. And, and without getting too in the weeds here and geeking out for your audience, there's an assessment in the book, mm -hmm. uh, and um, what that assessment tells you is your relative preference for these different interactive styles. So the ones that are easy for you, and there's usually one that's your distinct preference, and then a secondary one that you can adjust to. That adjustment's not too hard. When you get to the tertiary one, that's really the goal, and that one's going to be a little more clunky and take a little more time. And then that that quaternary that your fourth preference the the one you least prefer you may never ever get a level of comfort with that depending on how unappealing that is to you so easy uh, not initially but eventually well my biggest takeaway and this was the thing when i taught in my introduction i talked about the gap you know traditionally when i came out of school my first training was american express they taught us in four different personality styles here's the difference. What they taught me was simply how to overcome objections and to change the speed and cadence of my conversation, depending on whether I was a driver an expressive an analytic. Well, what, yeah. Uh, or amiable was the other one that they <laughs> did, but here's the difference in what you're teaching and what's in the book. This was my aha moment it talked about each personality's different needs. So not only identifying and adjusting how you communicate, 
but speak to their needs. And this was the missing component. This was the Rosetta Stone for me in terms of, <laughs> seriously, in yeah. terms of sales training, because I went through that, I went, that was an American Express at Washington Mutual. I went through consultative training. We did lots of these sales training, but never once did they talk about adjusting to the buyer's needs. And right. so, you know, I, I've read your book multiple times. I, I reread it last week because I knew we were going to be talking today. And that just stood out to me. And I said, you know, I really need to start paying attention to that because I, I'm pretty good at picking up on your style. Maybe I need to raise my awareness of it. But the needs thing is something I haven't consciously integrated and i'm excited right. excited to try that out so that's just a talking point on that so yeah. we're talking about sales but we have a lot of people on our program who are sales leaders or business leaders mm -hmm. so yeah. what makes a leader effective and is there one trait that all great leaders possess okay well so that to me there's there's a couple of questions in that question mm -hmm. so let me and let me dovetail on on the last uh, topic that you were you were uh, speaking about because I think it dovetails really nicely into this. And there's been a big movement in the last, I mean, that I'm aware of in the last decade. It, I'm sure it existed far before that, but the the empathy buzzword has become um, a big business talking point. You know, leaders need to have more empathy. Um, and I think. So one of the struggles is with with buzzwords like empathy people are like yeah it sounds good what, what is that exactly um so it's easier to kind of understand this notion of intrinsic needs that you made reference to different people respond to coax high performance out of someone They're, they've got to get paid and i'm not talking about their salary i'm not talking about their check i'm talking about intrinsically Mm -hmm. So again, to use an analogy, you know, you put gas in your car so it runs. When it runs out of gas, you could push it and it'll roll a little bit, but it'll stop again, or you put more gas in it. Intrinsic needs are like gas, where salaries and benefits are more like pushing the car. Oh, you'll get it rolling again, but it's going to stop pretty soon. So different people have different intrinsic needs. So for example, the romantic that I made reference before, who's very relationship oriented, thrives in environments where they feel appreciated. They're notoriously self-sacrificing. They often do things that other people are unwilling to do. They're great team members. But if you don't recognize that and appreciate that, then eventually that can turn to resentment and, and become negativity. Warriors thrive on competitive dynamics. They like to win and they like to be done. They're very productive. So they want to be left alone. They want independence. So right away, you've got two very different types of employees there, right? One person mm -hmm. needs you to, to give them a call or show up, pat them on the back, say, man, good job, way to go. The other one, you know, the more you can stay out of the way, the better, because, you know, no news is good news for them. That way I can get stuff done. Experts need security, you know, educate me, tell me what the expectations are, tell me all the parameters, give me the structure, make things consistent. And then masterminds, which I think if memory serves, you were a mastermind. Uh, Anthony, was that right? I think you're a mastermind. I think I'm a blend of that and romantic, but yes. Yeah. Think... So you're King Anthony from here on out. That's what we're we'll calling you. <laughs> Social reformer. Uh, so uh, masterminds are very conceptual, very future thinking, very entrepreneurial. And what they need is uh, is freedom and options, right? They, The thought mm -hmm. of, of work becoming Groundhog Day, where it's the same every day, is just uh, their purgatory. So they, you know, they need special projects. They need some latitude. They need, uh, you know, to be able to to act on their ideas and, and and do things new in different ways. So effective leaders, they you're a person too, right? As a leader, you have an intrinsic need. So typically, what leaders will default to is rewarding others with the same intrinsic need of, as they have. So if I'm a warrior leader, I'm going to reward you by leaving you alone. But if I got romantic people on staff, they're all out there being demo demotivated, saying, I don't know where I stand with this person. I do all this work. You think I get a thank you? I get nothing. Right. So right. so the key for a leader is 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 recognizing the intrinsic need of their people and to the degree that they can, making sure they have that in the environment so those people have the rewards they need. OK, so the key really for being great leadership is that recognition, that understanding of your employees. 
I, certainly that's a major key. Uh, you know, right. metacognition, we've already mentioned, is a huge important part, knowing yourself very well. And then the, the one thing that's in every one of my books uh, is this concept of internal locus of control, which is accepting full responsibility for everything that impacts you. Don't look around, don't blame. I, I, I really get irritated in meetings where people, you know, well, this customer didn't do that, or this coworker didn't do that, or this didn't happen, or this didn't happen. I don't really care. It doesn't change the situation we're in. What do we need to do? Not, not who do we need to blame? What do we need to do? And I think great leaders really spend their time looking at what do I need to do to get this to turn out the way it's supposed to. Yeah. It, 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 great, it, great perspective. And you talk about, and to me, this was another, another gold nugget when I was reading the book, uh, not only understanding the perspective of others, but you talk about connecting with your team as a sales leader. And specifically you had an acronym, but it standed for people preventative maintenance sessions. What, <laughs> what are these and why, why are they valuable? <laughs> you know, every time I'm uh, in an interview like this, Anthony, I'm, I'm reminded about how many analogies and metaphors have created my thought process. I was literally at a, a Jiffy Lube in Orlando, Florida, waiting to get my car changed. And I'm sitting there. And at that time in Central Florida, uh, the employment rate was nearly as low probably as, as, it, is, as it is now. And turnover in hospitality is notoriously high. So it was just, it, there was no bodies to find. We could not fill openings. Every day I was being tormented by managers. You know, I, you gotta get me people, you gotta get me people. I'm sitting waiting for my car to get its oil changed. And this is back in the mid nineties before cars told you when they wanted their oil changed. And I th said, it's strange because uh, no, the car doesn't tell me it needs its oil change. I just do it routinely every 3,000, 5,000 miles or so because I know it's good for the car. I don't want to wait until the car makes a funny noise and starts to smell bad because then the car is damaged, right? Mm -hmm. But that's what we're doing with our people. You know, people were quitting and we had no idea that they were unhappy because we waited until they made a funny noise and started to smell bad before we had a conversation with them. So I said, we need to change the oil preventatively. We need to have conversations with our people, whether they seem to need them or not, just to check in with them, just to say, hey, how's it going? What do you need that you don't have? How can I be more effective as a leader for you? Uh, what, what do you think needs to change in order for you to be able to perform at an even higher level? You know, and it's all listening and giving space to the employees to share this. It takes three or four months for that program to get rolling because nobody trusts it at first because we've been we never talk to them unless there's bad news. But man, once once people got comfortable with, oh, you're going to keep doing this, you're going to keep asking me these questions every month. Uh, we got so much good information uh, that literally we didn't need to do employee opinion surveys or anything like that. We had a continuous monthly dialogue with our employees that helped keep them performing at a high level and made us aware of all the things that employees assumed we knew that we didn't. And that's another thing in leadership. When Once you take the job leader or manager, employees now deem you as omniscient, right? Everything that happens now, you are fully aware of and you endorse, mm -hmm. which couldn't be further from the truth. Leaders know less about what's going on than anybody in the organization, right? So you got to have a mechanism for replugging into that. And that's what the, the people preventative maintenance process was. And I, I outline uh, the specific details of that program in the book. Yeah. And I, I love that. Uh, one thing that I implemented a couple years ago was a regular outbound call at least once a month to the top sales performers across the country. And it has worked extremely well. People feel valued. People feel connected. But the one thing definitely I'm going to add to this is first of all, have an awareness of each person's style and really integrate some of the needs suggestions in the book in there too. But boy, it makes such a difference. And you are correct. When you're in leadership, they think you know everything. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. and you don't, but I tell you, it, it has really created uh, loyalty. It's created a uh, high awareness of opportunity it has motivated the salespeople because somebody cares and is reaching out to me. So I, I love that. And I think that's great. And I think that's a, a positive thing to do and to continue to improve on doing that. Yeah, so, exactly. 
Yeah. So, okay. So for the audience out there right now, you know, we have salespeople, we have sales managers. What is sort of, what is one last piece of advice you'd like to leave our listeners with today? Well, uh, you know, we've kind of talked about lots of different topics and, and put those all together. The, the one thing that maybe we didn't touch on that I do think is, is a real important uh, consideration for any leader. Uh, and I noticed this not to bring up a painful memory for you, but like 2008, um, there was a lot of changes <laughs> in the environment <laughs> for many industries, uh, not the least of which your own. And um, what I found is before 2008, I was doing uh, a significant amount of what would be kind of considered teamwork or team building events where, you know, we're trying to strengthen our team. And if you can take any good out of a, a a financial calamity like happened in 2008, it really seemed to to flush out that dysfunction a bit. And te teams were pretty strong coming out of that. Uh, and to this day, I don't get nearly as many requests for team building. Uh, what I have seen, though, is we haven't really enhanced what I call seam work. Seam work is the fabric between functional teams. So, uh, you know, between sales and underwriting or you know uh operations and finance or you know all these so you've got these really strong people in this function and really strong people in this function and really strong people in this function but it's clunky as you pass through the functions whether it's the customer passing through or even the, in the employee experience mm -hmm. so uh that seam work where we sew ourselves together in those functional units to provide the culture of the organization still need some work and I think great leader and it falls to, to both the C-suite but also the mid-level leadership to, to strengthen those seams. It shouldn't feel different as a customer or as an employee if I'm dealing with this particular function versus that particular function. It all should be a fairly seamless uh, narrative that runs through all this. And that to me is kind of the difference between a, a a competent organization and an incredible organization is how strong their seam work is. Yeah, that's really good advice. While you were speaking, I was thinking, you know, about our organization and we do have all stars at different levels, but have we addressed it? Have we addressed the seams? Yeah. Um, and that's definitely something to consider and start integrating into our leadership as well. Well, yeah. Dave, you mentioned that you are a level two sommelier. Is I pronounce that correctly? Yes, I, I've got I, I've got my um, my oh gosh I've forgotten the name of it the little tin cup the the vin to something anyway I've got that that they gave me of course this is what fifteen years ago now uh, yeah but that was the it's like the ordained moment they give you the little tin cup that nobody ever uses anymore but it's a nice symbol. <laughs> well, I, I, I've, I've drank out of a tin cup, but that's another story. So anyway, um, <laughs> Saturday night on the corner of the <laughs> <laughs> you talk about a level two being certified. Now I've watched the documentary Psalm. Hopefully some of my audience has as well. So I feel I'm sufficiently educated to interview you about wine. <laughs> um, um, but you know, I'm watching this documentary and there's insanity in the uh, testing and what the, what yeah. they have you do now yeah. they were all level twos aspiring to be level threes and it just yes. looked like yeah. it looked like buds it looked like seal camp yeah. so no those are what, true cor true cork dorks those people that, that's I, a whole other level cork yeah. dork okay yeah. well we, we, we will make sure we use that in our <laughs> video clips what was the what's the hardest part of the level two test well i remember so uh now there's different um Desi uh, designating organizations, mm -hmm. right? Certifying organizations. So uh, for, for mine, you, you go, you get your level one designation, which was relatively easy. I mean, it was more just a matter of time and money, uh, but it was a fairly uh, broad but basic curriculum. So, you know, you're mm -hmm. thinking, okay, that's not too bad. Let's just, let's go, let's go for level two. That seems cool. And my first day on level two, the instructor said, what you will have to do in order to pass this course is correctly identify 40 wines uh, without tasting them. 40? Uh, 40, 40 glasses of wine, 40 tastes of wine laying out in the room, but you couldn't taste them. You could only smell and, uh, and look at them. Uh, and I'm like, 
Well, first of all, the only reason I was taking the class was to drink the wine. So that was a real turn off. Uh, but, but I mean, mind blown. It's like, there's no way. There's no way. I mean, there's no way. There's just simply no way. Uh, so really what they teach you, in addition, any wine education is rich with history and, and uh, the agricultural components and all that. But the big, the big focus is deductive reasoning. Is, is how you just start eliminating things, you know, based on the color of the wine, like big things initially, like, well, it's, it's not a white and it's not a rosé because it's clearly red. So that eliminates a lot of grapes right there. And you just keep, keep kind of peeling that off and smelling mm -hmm. and looking and smelling and looking and peeling off. And, you, you know, you eventually can, can do that. Now I, I couldn't do it now because that was, I'm not immersed in the industry to the degree that it requires, but a fully practicing uh, level two psalm uh, can very often pick a wine just by smelling it and looking at it. Wow, I thought the documentary was nuts, but uh, you verified that it isn't. <laughs> that yeah, and these, are, and these aren't those people. Those people are next level. Those people are they're they're like rain men with taste of in. That's a, that's what it is. The taste of in. Yeah. Well, uh, it's 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 amazing. Okay, so. You know, because of your expertise, and and th this question comes from my wife, so she wanted to know the best variety and your recommendation for day drinking. <laughs> uh, I came from your wife, did it? Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't Logical watch these. deniability. This isn't important to me, Dave, but my wife seems to want to drink day drink. Uh, yes, those are what we call porch wines, by the way, in the industry, <laughs> porch wines. Porch wines are ones that you crack open at, at like uh, two in the afternoon and then you wake up naked in a drainage ditch at eight. Um, so, uh, well, I, you know, sparkling wine is good during the day, I think. It's very celebratory. You know, what you theoretically, if you're day drinking, you know, I'm not judging your wife, but theoretically you'd want something <laughs> with a little lighter alcohol level, I would think, so that you day drinking doesn't become night sleeping. Uh, so you're trying to get through the day. So lighter alcohol would be one thing that I look at. Personally, I don't, I don't like heavy reds without food. Uh, just drink wine. I, I tend to stay away from like the Cabernet Sauvignons and the Merlots and the heavier reds. So if you want to do a red, I would stick with things like Beaujolais, Pinot Noir, something a little on the lighter side. Little Again, generally speaking, European wines have a little less alcohol than most American wines, but American wines are a little fruitier. So they're more fun, I think, to drink without food than European wines. Mm -hmm. um, Riesling is, uh, unfortunately, Riesling, a lot of us were exposed to Riesling young. It was one of our gateway drugs uh, with white Zinfandel. And so we're used to the, kind of the cloying, sweet Riesling. But a lighter, uh, less uh, sweet Riesling is a fun day drink, I think. But really, I mean, I, I reach for sparkling wine. And if you're rolling large, go all the way and get the champagne out. All right. Great advice. Um, no, it really was her question. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm what, party with her. Yeah, I want to be what, on that podcast. <laughs> uh, luckily, she's not on LinkedIn. Anyway, um, <laughs> so when we're talking about, I, I just wanted to ask you just one more question on wine. Sure. So you get exposed to a lot of wines. Any any upcoming coming uh, wines or wineries worth mentioning that you think maybe the audience should go check out? Well, I have to live in Walla Walla, so I can't really single out any particular winery without the risk of being criticized by, oh, the other 149 wineries that are here in Walla Walla. I would say if you've never, if a viewer has never visited Walla Walla, Washington, it's a must do if you're a wine lover. Um, it is uh, on the level of um, maturity, I guess. Um, Napa is the most mature wine region, obviously, in the United States, which means it's the most expensive. It's uh, the most opulent. To me, it's, it, it has almost become like a, an amusement park. Uh, behind Napa is Sonoma, which is to me is a little more accessible, a little more friendly. The, the, mm -hmm. the wineries are a little, little smaller and a little less expensive. Then you've got the Willamette region in uh, south of Portland there in Oregon, which is lovely, but it's a pretty specialized region. It's changing a little, but it's still pretty mm -hmm. Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Riesling heavy. So you can get a little bit of palate fatigue. 
Walla Walla, we literally, except for arguably Pinot Noir, which a few makers do make it, but it's it's not an easy make here. It's too hot. hot too, uh, so the weather's nicer. We can grow damn near every, everything. Uh, so you get different varietals when you go different uh, wineries. And, and it's a very concentrated area. And it's very rural, so it's very accessible. Uh, and you can still talk to the winemakers. You still talk to the owners. Uh, many of the wineries are boutique wineries, small production wineries. You won't be able to get these wines anywhere else but at the winery. So I would say Walla Walla as a whole, I sound like I'm a Chamber of Commerce uh, spokesperson, is, is some place that you should um, check out. In terms of a specific wine, I, you know, I'm, I'm again, I'm going to shill for Washington a little bit, but our Cabernet Francs, which is not a common varietal wine it's usually a blending wine for for a bordeaux blend right so mm -hmm. cap soft cap franc merlot petit verdot uh, malbec you know they blend those together to make bordeaux wines but uh, varietal cabernet franc meaning a, a bottle of the only grape in here is cabernet franc washington makes that better than anybody in the world in my opinion including Chenon in France that's known for it. Uh, they're just incredible wines. So if you haven't had a Cab Franc from Washington and specifically Walla Walla, rush out and try that because I think you'll be really delighted. It's a, it's a cool wine. Well, that's thank you for your advice and uh, your wine politics. And uh, <laughs> so everybody heard that a Cab Franc from, from Washington. Well, Dave, yeah. Dave for, for our audience, if someone wants to connect with you, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Yeah, well, my website is theleadershipdifference.com. So you mm -hmm. see in the graphic below me there, theleadershipdifference.com. Uh, and my email is dave at theleadershipdifference.com. Uh, and on LinkedIn, I think you would search Dave Mitchell slash TLD. Uh, and uh, of the myriad of Dave Mitchells on LinkedIn, mine should be at the top of that list with that slash uh, or hashtag, I guess it is. You're right yet. So uh, um, no slash, it's slash. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, so that'd be that. Those are the easiest ways, I think, to get a hold of me. Excellent. Well, Dave, thank you for being on our program today. We really appreciate you sharing your insights around building strong, uh, strong relationships by understanding the intrinsic needs of others and how to interact with them. I'm so still feeling that it's been 11 years since we first met. That doesn't seem possible. A lot of wine. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, from all of us here at the Sales Lab, thank you for listening and have a great day.